Hey, welcome everybody to Hurdlers of Adversity, Inspirers and Maximizers of Pivotal Moments. You are live with John Register and I cannot wait for our guest who is going to be coming on and gracing us with her presence today. Uh, so I work with business professionals all across the world to help them hurdle adversity, amputate their fear, embrace a new normal mindset to win the medals in their life. And as you know, this show is just getting up and close and personal with those individuals who get a chance that we get a chance to hear their stories, hear their journeys. And from that, we glean this great information from our own lives. So we have some people that are just jumping on right now. StreamYard is on board. Who is out there right now jumping in with us? So you can put that in the chat box. But um, our theme this month has been always with our Olympic and Paralympic athletes. And we've been focusing on the Olympic athletes, especially when we're coming into a time in our, our, our kind of world history of just challenges that are going on. And what do we learn, what do we glean from these Olympic and uh, Paralympic athletes? And uh, like I said, we're, we're gleaning from the Olympic athletes this time. So put where you are. If you've been enjoying this conversation, did you hear the last ones that happened? Because we had like last week, Adlin Gray. We had two weeks ago, Apollo Ono. We had uh, three weeks ago to start the year off, Ronaldo, Skeets, Nehemiah. So it's been really phenomenal conversations. And all of those are pinned to the um, uh, pinned to the timeline. Patrice Ravenscroft, thank you so much. I just had a good conversation with one of your buddies uh, the other day. So thank you for joining. Always great. Yes, it, these are so fa fantastic conversations, Patrice. So thank you. So, you know, for those that don't know who I am, I have been doing this now, I guess, when LinkedIn gave me the, the, the feature for LinkedIn Live, uh, several shows. And uh, here's why I'm, I'm jumping into this space, because I am one that has had a lot of grace and been given to me, number one, and that I've been trying to really help individuals through that, extend it to others to help them with the journeys that they are going on. Uh, in, in their lives. Uh, so Patrice says, yes, she's in Colorado Springs. She's right down the road there. And I really appreciate you being on. Uh, so at 529 in the afternoon on May 17th, 1994, I was one of the fastest hurdlers and 400 meter hurdles in the United States. Top eight in the country, top 20 in the world. Uh, I was on my way to officer candidate school for the United States military. I, I'd just been boarded for uh, for going to, going to officer candidate school. And, you know, I had a, my life was just set before me. But at 530 on that same day, I would misstep a hurdle, dislocate my left knee, sever the artery behind the kneecap. And then seven days later, have a, an elective surgery to amputate my left knee right above, uh, right above the knee. So true above knee amputee. Uh, so what do you do? Uh, I my life was not really going down a downward spiral, but, you know, I was really thinking kind of negative thoughts. And we always want to have a mindset that it keeps positive thoughts with us. So I was thinking, you know, how's my wife going to respond to this? How's she going to react? Will she still stay with me? Will my son still see me as his dad? Will I still have a job in the United States military? All these things were in my mind. And I was kind of kind of spiraling down a little bit and, and not really believing in the capabilities of what had brought me to this one point in life. It's my wife, Alice, who says to me, you know what, John, we are going to get through this together. It's just our new normal. And with that, with those words, uh, she really based my, my entire existence. And I began to retool, repurpose and refocus my mindset on what could be next in life. So I don't look at the new normal as a destination. The new normal, like our Olympic model of Sidious Altius Fortius, which written in the superlative, which, which when translating into English, means swifter, higher, stronger, is not written in the superlative of the word. It's not the highest form of the word. But it's written with this ER stem ending that we can be the swiftest today, but swifter tomorrow. We can jump the highest today, jump higher tomorrow. We can lift the heaviest weight today, lift heavier weight tomorrow. So that's what I began focusing in on, is that the ceiling becomes the floor, and we need to, I needed to push into that space. So about 18 months later, I swam for physical therapy and wound up making the Paralympic swim team, if you can believe that. And then I went to Sydney, Australia, learning how to run on an artificial limb and won the silver medal over in Sydney, Australia uh, in, and capturing the American record in the process. And from that, I began, like I said, we have to leave legacy. And I started uh, uh, working for, with the Olympic Committee, built out the Paralympic Military Sport Program and some youth programs. 
to really help individuals uh, move in that in that direction. So uh, that's kind of the background, and we're we're pushing these out because I want to introduce you to buddies of mine, friends of mine, people that I haven't met, just so that you can uh, get a sense of how you can do it too, how you can win the medals in your life. So um, I'm very thankful for StreamYard, for LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, uh, and all the social platforms that are pushing this out right now. So how many of you have had to, kind of this is the big question uh, today that I'm thinking about is assist with your parents. Uh, this is the, the, the time of life that I'm coming into right now. It's it's uh, taking you know home care facility. It's moving them from one place to another place. It's getting on bank accounts now. It's, it's really helping them uh, in their, their later years of life. And it, it's, it's really been a struggle. So if you had to do that and had to go through that, tell me, uh, <laughs> put, put that in the chat box because uh, I need some help on that one, right? Hey, we have uh, Cheryl Bingham is on. All right. Looking forward to hearing Michelle. Yes. Love that. Uh, thank you, Cheryl. And as always, we still, we say it every week, we got to go climb the staircase. We got to go climb the staircase. The the, the stair stepper, the, the natural stair stepper in Colorado Springs and Manitou Springs. And that is the incline. We got to get doing this. When the snow melts, we can get up there and do it. Um, so, okay. We've been, theme has been Olympians and, and Paralympians. We've been talking with Olympians. Uh, we just share with you about the city's Altius Fortius. Thank you all for being on. Let's get into it. So I was going to ask you who was the silver medalist in 1984 all around gymnast. I was going to ask you to put that in the chat box, but guess what? Cheryl already spilled the beans. <laughs> she already spilled the beans, y'all. Uh, so listen, she was the youngest member of the 1984 Olympic gymnastics team who won the silver medal team all around in Los Angeles. She helped the city of Colorado Springs raise $1 million dollars to help build the community's first universal accessible playground, which was inspired by her oldest daughter, Abby. She is a graduate of Arizona State, Gold Sun Devils. She has worked for NBC Sports at the 92, 96, and 2000 Olympics, as well as ABC Sports as a researcher, very important job there, and is currently the VP of Athlete Engagement at the uh, award-winning United States Olympic and Paralympic Museum in Colorado Springs. Uh, that's Olympic City, USA, USA, USA. Her husband, Matt, is trying to rope me into another venture, which is, looks like it's going to be an adventure. <laughs> Please help me welcome my friend, my colleague, the amazing Michelle Ducer Farrell. How you doing, Michelle? I'm great, John. How are you? I'm great, too. We got Cheryl on here. Look, the whole, <laughs> whole blast from the past is on. Thank you for being on today. I really I really do appreciate it. Um uh, to, to kind of get into it right now, you know, I look at gymnastics, um, not kind of the current state, but kind of in the overall, it's one of the, the powerhouses of the Olympic Games. So it's always like swimming, right. gymnastics, and track and field. Those are kind of like the anchors of uh, of the games of the broadcast that happen. And you were the youngest member on the 1984 team. So, so how, how old were you then? So I was 15 when I competed uh, that summer in 84. Uh, I was, I had just finished my freshman year in high school. And so, but for gymnasts like myself, um, oftentimes the trajectory of from when you become an Olympic hopeful to actually being on the Olympic team can be quite short. So for me, it happened while I had been in the sport many years um, for when, from the time that I was kind of that in that hopeful category mm. to actually being named to the team was about 18 months. So uh, it, it happened pretty fast, but in gymnastics, athletes, you know, they, they tend to go, go through a very rapid progression and go from, you know, unknowns to, to then on top of the podium or, you know, in the mix for, for Olympic medals. So that was the case for me. Um, it happened quite fast on, you know, that spectrum, but, um, you know, it was fantastic. So. It's it's interesting, you know, that you say I was fifteen because I, I I see these I see these young young gals coming in there and they're like three. <laughs> so you were like you were like ancient at fifteen. But I had started the sport at five, so at that point I had been doing the sport for ten years. So so yeah. yes, um, but of course you know starting at five you're not training 25, 30 hours a week. You're going 
one day a week for one hour lessons. And then from there, it's sort of, you know, then it shifts to two days a week. And then all of a sudden you're competing and traveling and, and doing as such. So, so what was the attraction for you? Uh, watching the 1972 games and Olga Corbett. Uh, I was a kid with a lot of energy. And so my mom was looking for an outlet to, to burn some of the energy and, and to get me to go to sleep before 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> so she, she enrolled me in class. Um, so that was how I got my start, but what really, really stoked my like drive and, and wanting to like reach the Olympic games was watching Nadia in 1976. Mm, wow, and I have wow. vivid memories of that summer watching and basically, um, being just, you know, like mesmerized by what she, the gymnastics she was doing, but what happened that summer when she scored the first perfect 10 for me was a pivotal moment because I had been doing the sport for a few years and watching that event happened almost gave me license to, to dream big things. Everybody thought when, you know, she scored that first perfect 10, that it was impossible. Nobody was ever going to score a 10 and she did it. So for me, it gave me a little bit of, you know, that license to say, gosh, if she can do what people thought to be impossible, why can't I set, these great goals of, of someday becoming an Olympian. So that for me was like the switch that turned in terms of, you know, having that opportunity to say, gosh, you know, like she did what everybody thought couldn't be done. Why can't I, you know, pursue that for myself? You know, I think that is, uh, I, I have a lot of thoughts happening in my head right now. I, I never ever get this go to my script because <laughs> that just, the conversation just is amazing. Um, so here's what I'm, here's what I'm thinking, right? We have these inspirational moments that happen in our lives. And I use that word not sparingly. I, I, it's a power word for me now because I believe that inspiration is a catalyst to motivation and then motivation in turn causes actions, actions leads to transformation results. And those results, they re-inspire us or allow other people that are watching to catch the vision. So when you're saying that this inspirational moment happens when you're watching Nadia Komanich, now you are beginning to dream of what is actually possible for you. Um, right. How does how do you parlay that into what we're seeing with a Vice President Kamala Harris, or uh, we see a, a Barack, o, a President Barack Obama, or you see somebody else that's down the road that the woman that just I can't remember her name is failing me right now that just went from the Starbucks CEO to Walgreens CEO right now, right? Kind of jumped over somebody else. We see this, this shift of kind of silently in the background, all these women leaders who are now coming up. Right. And I think it's, you know, again, it's it's being able to see what, you know, what could be then to, to set that dream, but then also surrounding yourself with people who can help facilitate mm -hmm. that and, and give that kind of empowering, you know, mindset. And I felt like that with my teammates. Um, I felt like I was surrounded by others, other young women who had those same dreams, but who were there in a supportive. We all knew, you know, like we all knew how hard it was because we were going through it side by side. And we were there to to not only, you know, help push one another, but help lift one another up when we needed it. And in fact, just last week, um, we got on and did a Zoom call last Wednesday with our team. And it was fantastic because again, you know, I think we were on for three hours and we could have kept going. What's great is that you can sit down and chat and feel like you can just pick up where you left off last time. Um, but what we, you know, part of the conversation too was, you know, we went through something pretty extraordinary and we have that just lifelong bond of, of having those same experiences and, and knowing what it took. So, I think that's what's really been special about that experience of, of going to an Olympic Games is that you do remember and have moments of like great adulation for, you know, like the competition and what we accomplished. But we're, what really lasts is the friendships and relationships and the bonds that you built during that time. For sure. One of the one of the pillars that we have, the seven pillars of the friendships that are are formed from the games themselves. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Over this respect that happens. So uh, what was, give me, give me an insight, like if you're kind of summarize the career up, an insight that you take away today from, uh, from your gymnastics career. So Maybe I think I know. was, yeah, so I think I was, I was so fortunate to have that experience as a, as a kid. 
um, as a 15 year old. And so, but I'd also had a chance to do some world travel before that. So I was getting to see the world, getting to meet, you know, people from all different places and cultures and developing this amazing network of, of people through the sport. And so I felt with the experience of going to the games and everything that surrounds the games, not only the competition, but, you know, you're walking into opening ceremony and you're feeling, you know, how much bigger this is than your, you know, just yourself and your competition. And so I left that experience feeling a sense of duty and um, a sense of, of feeling like I had to like continue to, to advocate and, and to live the Olympic ideals. And so I think because of that experience at the age that I was at, it really set me up to continue to look for ways to give back and to use my experience in a positive way, whether it's talking to kids at schools or, you know, volunteering through um, the U.S. Olympic Committee or the Organization of Gymnastics. Um, I just always felt this sense of duty to give back and to help broaden that reach for um for those who, you know, were fans of the games and fans of the sport, but also who, you know, had the opportunity to, you know, be inspired by something. So yeah. I think that's kind of where, um, you know, when I look at, look back on the things that I've done um, post gymnastics career, I think so many of those um, projects and the things that I've done had been influenced by my experience at the games. So you have had a lot of experience after the games. And I, I remember, I think, with uh, my first recollection of us meeting was at the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs. Uh, yeah. I think it was with your daughter, Abby, in a, in a magazine shoot that I, I think was like, why am I in this magazine? What's going on here? And I walk in and I see this adorable <laughs> showstopper, <laughs> little blonde-headed kid, uh, three years old. <laughs> yep, she was three. She was three, yeah, three years old. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, who's this kid? Um, and I think that's the first the first time we met. And so tell us a little bit about Abby because Abby has spina bifida, uh, and kind of world kind of can shift when you're just transitioning from uh, your sport and you got a life going on. All of a sudden, you have this this child is and and uh, in, in spina bifida. So what was going on in your mind during that time? Yeah. So, you know, uh, Abby's our oldest daughter. So, uh, you know, found out when I was pregnant that uh, she had the di diagnosis of spina bifida. So it was, you know, a pretty big shift and change for us as parents to go, OK, now we have to, you know, basically be ready to accommodate and um, have things in place that will allow her to have, you know, those same opportunities that every child would have that as a parent, you'd want to make sure your child would have. Um, and so, but as she, you know, has grown and had, you know, many of these great opportunities, um, you know, we've grown as parents as well to see that, you know, like we were, we've been able to also help to create things for Abby that now she, um, proud to say that she's also a very strong advocate for herself and those in her community, um, to make sure that, voices are heard and access is, you know, re it's a reminder to people about, you know, making sure that access is equitable and, and available to everybody. Um, and so I think, you know, we had some experiences when she was uh, quite young. Uh, we learned about universally accessible playgrounds. And for me, that really connected and resonated as a young parent to yeah. see something that I could do to be a positive impact on Abby and her peers, um, but that also really um, promoted recreation and independent recreation. And so, um, you know, Abby uses a wheelchair um, when she was younger and um, smaller, she used a walker. Um, mm -hmm. And playgrounds are not designed for accessibility devices. And so we learned about the universally accessible playground design and felt very strongly about making sure that that was available here in Colorado Springs. And so worked with the city, helped to do some fundraising, grant writing, got the playground built. Um, it's now been open for 10 years. Wow, <laughs> and uh, we now have a second playground in town with a third, I believe, planned. 
so it's you know it's been rewarding because my hope was to 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 build the one and to to have it be a lesson in how we could be civically active and engaged with our community to um build awareness around the need for accessibility with you know places like playgrounds abby became very involved in it and she became a you know a young advocate for this as well but what happened is once we opened we found people reaching out to us and saying uh, you know we live in pueblo or we live in parker and we want to do the same thing and that was exactly what i was hoping to have happen mm -hmm. is that you know from what we did in our own community that it would spark the idea for others to do the same in their community. Um, what really made the project work here is that we're, we're citizens of Colorado Springs and, and Abby, you know, lives here. So what was important is that, you know, we spread that word so that others in other communities would have that, they would resonate and have that same connection to their community, which really um, helps the project along. So. Yeah, I, I think the the project is absolutely fantastic, and to have somebody to come in early on to share, you know, their life journey in this, and both you as as you know, you and Matt as parents, as well as Abby, you know, going through and seeing how you can advocate for yourself. It just doesn't happen that often with parents who have you know kids when they call them quote unquote, unquote special needs. Uh, and and we have and we then we use that term and then they fall into this category. Whereas you and Matt were able to just really share the world through your lens, through your eyes. And and so I'm interested in what what made you think about that um, uh, as you were you know finding out that you were going to uh, to to have to have Abby right. So what what was it in you that flipped it? Because I don't think a lot of parents they they get that they they become overprotective. And so why don't we do this with, we'll bring a, a special guest into it as you begin to answer this. Our special guest is, ba -da -da -da. <laughs> <laughs> we have Abby herself is here. All right. Hi. Hi, Mom. Hi. <laughs> Good to see you. You too. So yeah, so, so what, as, as parents, what, what made you, you know, just kind of, just switch your mindset around it. Well, I I think that we're both from a sport background and, you know, we couldn't imagine, you know, any children that we have, you know, with Abby coming first and we have also a younger daughter, Zoe, they wouldn't have the opportunity to participate in sport. And so, and at that point when Abby was born, um, adaptive sport was starting to grow and, um, but the playground was kind of like, like at the root and the, you know, like the, first time that most kids are introduced to physical activity, yeah. but it's also about social development and, and interacting with your peers. And it often happens for the first time at a playground, you know, you take a young child there and all of a sudden three-year-olds are playing in the sand and they're having that first social interaction with another person their age. So, um, but if, if it's not accessible and there are barriers for, for kids to get around, then, you know, that important developmental um, opportunity is lost. So that was kind of what really like, it was the, you know, it was really that aha moment for me of like, gosh, maybe, maybe this whole Olympic experience thing was meant to prepare me for, for a project like this, yeah, that I could, true. you know, take this and, and then, you know, work to, to build a better community and help to be one small, tiny piece of that, so. And I got to steal it to be on my social media team for a summer, so <laughs> I'm very happy about that. And she's wearing her Illini shirt, so we can <laughs> we can actually rip that off <laughs> you right now. Um, <laughs> but Abby, did you uh, did you ever feel a sense of like the helicopter parent from from uh, mom and dad, from Matt and, and uh, Michelle? No, not at all. I mean, kind of like she said, like kind of their goal as parents and something that I'm grateful for is that they taught me how to be independent and like didn't let me be babied in any in any way and I because of that I'm I wouldn't be where I am today. And so now you're studying now at University of Illinois you're on the basketball team what what's your what are you studying what's what's the goal that you have uh, because you've been afforded all these opportunities? So I'm currently a senior at the University of Illinois. I'm majoring in communications with a minor in public relations. And from that, uh, 
the career path isn't crystal clear, but what I do know is kind of what uh, my mom mentioned was that just, I really do have a passion for adaptive sport and Paralympic sport um, and just sport in general um, and just working with people with disabilities and um, being able to be in a position where I can show people that Paralympic athletes are just the same as Olympic athletes and that they deserve the, the same amount of respect and, and resources, uh, whether it's um, just at a, at a state level or at a university or um, just at the at the Paralympic level. I, I think um, that's, that's kind of the goal at, at this point. That's something that I'm really passionate about and something that I would hope to do in the future. I love it. And I just wanted to see your mother's expression when I brought you on. That's, that's the only <laughs> I'm so list. proud. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Well, I mean, it's always great to see, you know, sh she's at school now at Illinois. And, um, but yeah, it's, you know, it's interesting because like having the discussion about way back, you know, when she was born and everything, it just, it's, you know, like, it's such a means for reflection, but also to see like, Fast forward now, you know, everything we'd hoped for. And, you know, as parents, you do everything you can with what you know how to do um, with the tools that you have. Right. Um, but couldn't be more proud of Abby and what she's doing, getting her degree um, just a semester away now from finishing and Ooh. and looking to see what's next. And um, but, you know, but then, you know, always helping and continuing to to give her support for for those next steps as well. But now she's a, a young independent adult and able to start, you know, playing that role as, you know, a young adult advocate for for herself and others in her community and and uh, with the world out in front of her. So I love it. I love it. And the reason I'm giving Abby hard time is because over her mother's head there, you can look up on the top shelf and you'll see a razorback hog hat. Oh, absolutely. I'm <laughs> never going to let you live that down. <laughs> we got to add some Illinois to that show. <laughs> Abby, thank you for being on for a few minutes. It's, like I said, I wanted to just surprise your mom. We're about to go into our speed round. So if you get back on, you can watch your mom go to speed <laughs> round for us. Uh, these questions that we have. Thanks for being on, Abby. Awesome. Thanks, John. Bye. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's yeah, great. Right. I gotcha. <laughs> Just like you got me on my artificial leg <laughs> museum. Um, so um, I want to come back and talk about the museum. I know we have a few more minutes here, but I want to go into our speed round. I'm going to come back and, and ask you about the uh, Olympic and Paralympic Museum in Speed City, USA. So I got these these questions called JR's Flash Round. JR's Flash Round. We are going right now because I know you got to be done in about, in about five, six minutes here. Um, okay, here we go. Uh, favorite activity to do when vegging out? Hmm. Uh, I like to work out. I like to do my workout. Work out. Okay. Yep. One thing people find quirky about you. I can't open a bottle of wine to save my life. <laughs> the wine. The wine. Uh, <laughs> favorite Olympic moment or could be fairly Olympic moment. Oh, man, uh, that's hard. I mean, obviously, watching Nadia was a pivotal moment for me. I have to say, like, as a as a spectator, um, I got the chance to work at the 2002 Paralympic Games and watching the sled hockey team win gold. Oh, my gosh. That, that was, was one of the best. So, <laughs> that was, yeah, that was great. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, mountain biking or skiing? Skiing. Skiing. OK. Bonus question: Person you would most like to hear, likely to want to hear from on this show next? Ooh, uh, oh, that's a tough one. That's a. No, it's my tea up because I want to know. I, I like. don't know. <laughs> I'm like my head is swirling. There's thousands. Uh, maybe a great, you know, like a great more seasoned Olympic or Paralympic alumni. All Maybe right, well, somebody from the 60s or 70s. Oh, nice. Uh, like a Dick Fosbury, maybe. Okay. Maybe. Okay, all right. All right. Great. Okay, thanks for playing. You got five for me? I do. All right. Okay, I'm ready. All to... right. Beach or mountains? Say it again. Beach or mountains? Beach. Do you have a sweet tooth or a salt, savory or salty? 
Sweet Tooth. What's your movie genre? Action. Action. All right. I'm rom-com, so. Oh. <laughs> and Two Truths and a Lie. Two Truths and a Lie. Okay. I um, uh, Two Truths and a Lie. So you got to guess it, or do I have to just tell two truths? Tell me a truth and a lie, and then I have to guess which one is truth. Okay. Uh, I'll tell, okay, okay. So let me get, let me get in my head. I, okay. Um, I play the cello. I sang with Aretha Franklin. I ran the Armington Myler. Ooh. So I think you've sent, I think you've sung with Aretha and I think you've run the Army 10 Myler. Behind me is my cello. I win. Oh. <laughs> I have not run the Army 10 Myler. Oh, um, yes. <laughs> nice. That was good. I like that. You stumped that. me. You stumped me. <laughs> I got this <laughs> Uh Okay. So I want to go over to the, the Paralympic Museum. Thanks for playing the, along with that. You are going to receive, I'm going to bring that over to you for playing. Look at that. It is handed down a letter opener. Nice. Ooh, okay. sweet. Uh, so uh, with the Paralympic Museum, we're talking about Olympic City, USA now in Colorado Springs. You already built out the playground. How important is this museum for our nation? It's won a couple of awards already um, that I know about, and it is probably one of the most accessible museums I've ever been in. What does that mean to you and, as you are now working over there as the uh, vice president of uh, athletes relations? So it means the world and the fact that I was part of a group of athletes that were brought into the pro, uh, project pretty early on to just meet and talk about the Olympic and Paralympic experience. And from that first meeting up through to when we, you know, cut that ribbon and opened our doors, um, I've been proud that we've had such involvement from our Paralympic athletes, um, their voice, their vision, their input, their thoughts, sharing their experiences. Um, you know, I feel like it's super representative uh, of of that experience so that when visitors come through, they can see as just as much about the Paralympic experience as they do about the Olympic, but that also the accessibility design has been extremely thoughtful um, so that it's not like what we did with the playground. It was meant to be designed from the ground up to be inclusive and not to be necessarily retrofitted. The same goes for the museum. Um, the design and development was really thoughtful from the ground up to create um, an accessible experience that not was a, not only accessible, but created a parallel experience for every visitor. Right. So, and one of the kind of main characteristics of that is the architectural design is such that you go up in an elevator, every single visitor does go up in the elevator. And then once you get up to the top, from third floor down to, um, the first floor where you end your visit, everything is ramped. So we're a family, Abby's a real uh, uh, fan of amusement parks and she loves going to, you know, a lot of the um, amusement parks and doing rides. But a lot of times your access to a ride might be a different path or a different way. And so I think, um, you know, what we've done at the museum and what we've intended to do is to make sure that, you know, like I'm, I with Abby can go through and we don't have to separate from our group to find an elevator or to find different, you know, means for changing floors and that yeah. you can stay with your group the whole time. Yeah, I, I love, and I've been over there less than you, but a, a, enough times to know that it, it's a special place um, that holds a, a lot of, not just the artifacts, but, but it really does show the journey of, of athletes and um, and all Olympians and Paralympic athletes, and everybody gets that parallel experience. It's it's really very well done. So congratulations on all that you have done for that. Um, when you think about your kind of life now and what you are giving back to the community, uh, what is something that you have found is valuable for sharing with the business community on what you have learned? I think that, you know, like, inclusion is additive for everybody and everything like inclusion is good business <laughs> and so it's i mean uh it's it you know it is the one group that any one of us can be a part of become a part of at any moment and so 
um, you know, access and accessibility is is just good business all the way around. It's the right thing to do. Um, but I think now that we're, you know, we're, I guess, 30 years from the Americans with Disabilities yep. Act being yep. signed, that mm -hmm. um, I think now we're, we're into a phase, you know, from the time that that was signed to now um, really being thoughtful with design and not not designing and looking backwards, but designing, starting looking forward. Sure. And that's exciting. That's exciting. So, so. if you've been enjoying this conversation with Michelle Farrell, um, shout her out in the chat box, put what you have learned, the lesson you learned, put her at sign in there. We want to make sure that you're giving her some love. We're giving her love for being on this show today. I know she has to run for another meeting and uh, so I don't want to keep her too, too long. Uh, but what are there? Are you out there on social media? How do people find you and connect with you? Yeah, I, I, I I'm out there. I'm not super active, but um, at baby Jim 84 uh, is my Twitter and Instagram. But uh, yeah, I just, uh, you know, my description is pretty much, you know, like mom, wife and lover of all things that promote accessibility and and uh that I really, you know, the job that I'm doing now at the museum is just, um, I feel so grateful to have the opportunity to share and uncover these amazing stories of athletes. I feel like it's a, you know, like it's a treasure chest every day when we we connect with athletes and hear about what they're doing now. And the stories are just, it is just a wealth out there of things to discover that is just exciting to share and, yeah. and inspire our visitors, so. You know, that is, that's just phenomenal um, because uh, we all, when I look at inclusion, I also include the word belonging because we not only do we want, want to feel included, we also want to feel a sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of individuals will come into an environment that have a disability and they'll be included, uh, but not necessarily feel a sense of belonging in the organization. It's it's kind of like, oh, we have you over here, but you you're part of us, but uh, maybe not really. Uh, so I, I think that sense of belonging is what we are all looking for, and what you just explained there, I, I think, is, is actually powerful for organizations to do that because disability there is an advantage and a bottom line dollar revenue um, amounts that happens when two companies are alike together. Um, one hires, retains, promotes people with disabilities, and the other one does not. This company A actually outperforms company B by two to one to shareholder returns. We've seen mm -hmm. that Accenture report that came out in Q4 about 2018. So yeah. I want to thank you, um, Michelle, once again for being on. I know you got to run, um, but I really do appreciate you and all the work that you're doing, not only in Colorado Springs community, but around the world as well. Well, John, it's always a pleasure to chat with you. Thanks for inviting me and and uh, always look forward to working with you. Thank you, ma'am. Have a great day. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Bye now. Bye. That is the incredible Michelle Ducer Farrell, uh, Farrell and she has uh, just had a run to another meeting. So thank you all for being on and hearing just the great um, insights that she was pouring and giving out to us uh, for a lot of the things that you heard around disability, around her time as a, as an Olympian, uh, as uh, her daughter is, you know, trying to buy for a spot in the Paralympic team. Uh, yes, uh, absolutely, Cheryl. Um, truly an inspiration for sure. Uh, Dave Pullen was on saying, I enjoy listening to you guys as long as I could. Keep inspiring. He's up in Alaska. Uh, we had um, Lynn Keir that was on. Uh, she came on a little bit late. She said I had trouble getting on LinkedIn. So um, that's, 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 that's not cool. Um, so we talked about their favorite activities and all the, what she does vegging out. And that was fun for our, our JR's flash round. Let me know if you like those flash rounds. I like them because they're just kind of interesting to see what people are thinking about. Okay. So next week we are headed uh, into the Super Bowl week. So who's your team? Who's your team? Who's got, who you got, who you got? Um, is it going to be Brady? Da, 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 da. You got to put that in the break. Or is it going to be Kansas city? Uh, who's going to, who's going to get it? Okay. Um, so we got uh, Craig Doman. Uh, he's going to be on with us. He's going to help us understand what it takes to make it big because he's an agent. He used to be an agent for sports. And um, uh, you might be surprised by some of his answers, how you get into the league. Uh, we got McCombs and Brady. Brady McCombs. It's going to be cool. The young Turk versus the old guy. 
Uh, the old guy, Resjunctor, is going to be a, a changing of the times. What's going to happen? So the next big announcement uh, is we we uh, we picked up. If, if you want to look at some of these shows and the past shows that we've had, it's all over the Olympic uh, the Olympic shows that we've been doing. You can pick them up on YouTube full. Uh, you can also pick them up pinned on the LinkedIn group. And if you're over in the Facebook group, you can pick it up there too. If you want to join the Facebook group, it's www. I'm sorry, www. Facebook.com slash groups with an S slash amputate fear, and that gets you into the group. Um, the, and then the final thing is uh, the next big announcement. My dear friend April Holmes and I are going to go live on Clubhouse starting on Mondays. So we want to make sure that you're in the room where it happens. We're going to be doing some uh, some crazy stuff over there. Uh, so that is going to be coming up. Stay tuned for that. Uh, more information will be forthcoming. Finally, remember, you are the inspirations. Inspirations are the catalyst to motivation. Motivation in turn causes actions. Actions lead us to transformation results. And these results, they re-inspire us or they allow someone else that's watching the process to actually catch the vision. So we thank you so much for uh, being on with us today. Go forth, inspire your world. We'll be here back here next year at uh, next year. Next week at 312 in the afternoon with um, with uh, who did I say? Craig Doman, uh, who we're going to talk to right before the Super Bowl. So, all right. We'll see you later. Go forth and spy your world. Bye for now.